difference between you and me, Paula? Did you want to say opening or closing? Um, I could probably say the opening. <laughs> Thank you. Heavenly Father, so grateful for our new day. Thank you. We come to you this morning and invite you to be with us today. Invite your spirit to be with us today. We're so grateful for this study session and be able to be able to finish this talk. And finish this you know, this series of talks. It's been really enlightening and grateful for the discussions all, all along this way and coming to a greater understanding. Um, we ask you to be with those who <clears throat> are not with us at this point and those who will listen. Um, those who have been struggling with sicknesses and whatever challenges that they're facing in their life and circumstances, will you please bless them with those things that you know they are in need of. We know that you are aware and that you're walking with each of us. I just thank you for this opportunity and say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Paula. Thank you. <laughs> We're on page page thirty-eight. Okay. Um, okay, I can start reading. This is really apparent when you read the revelations given to Joseph in their original transcripts. In our scriptures, there are headings, footnotes, cross-references, and additional insertions advocating we read those revelations as ours. But when you read them as they were written in the Joseph Smith papers, it really becomes clear that when God was speaking about how the church was living and alive and approved, it is because it was because he was talking to Joseph Smith. At the time the church was listening to what Joseph Smith revealed, the declaration that the work was rolling forth was the voice of God in that day to those people. Joseph Smith was called to lead those people to go and take it to the world. They took it and they went out and preached it. And when they preached it, others were converted. People who were converted by them actually had experiences and came to know God. That was because God empowered it and set it in motion through his servant, Joseph Smith. Joseph had a covenant given to him by God. Therefore, Joseph could testify to these words and they were true and God owned them. People who follow them received the wages of those who follow God. It worked. We cannot mimic that and have the same effect. We must do the work seek God's voice to us, and when we have his word, to proceed. I just wanted to make a comment that I feel that um, where it says the church was living alive and approved, I feel because of Denver being um, called as the Lord's servant, that once again, the church is living, alive and approved. And while we're remembering uh, the restoration, what was given through Joseph Smith, um, 
we're also, while we have, well, I think it, the quote goes, when you have living oracles or wherever you can find an authorised administrator, there is the kingdom of God. And it doesn't mean that we rely solely on Denver and Denver's testimony. It's saying uh, in the previous paragraph that we need to have faith to renew and keep a covenant given to us by God. So we have that first initial covenant where Denver took his covenant, well, with the Lord's approval, <laughs> the Lord's dictating it, and embodied it into an ordinance for the people. And now you and I and the people need to take that covenant, do the work and get a covenant for ourselves, I think, mm -hmm. um, from God directly, not from Denver. Right. So, so long as we're like giving heed, um, we must do the work, as it says here, seek God's voice to us. And when we have his word to proceed. I can't remember if it was you that said something to the fact that these 10 talks were like an ordinance. Somebody had said something along that line. Okay. Yeah. So this is all part of an ordinance given by God. Mm -hmm. I feel it's an ordinance to um, lay a correct foundation of faith within us. And because angels, uh, that's what they do. They correct faith. So that yes. on that on that firm foundation we can stand and move forward um, to God ourselves. So, yeah, it's an ordinance. I think, I think we really, you know, looking back, one of the key points in all of this, um, I feel, is uh, reminding us of bringing people back to the lectures on faith because we had lost that and that that right there is so important in understanding who God is, his characteristic characteristics and attributes. And when we actually have that correct understanding, along with all of this, this is, um then that can um produce the salvation um life eternal which you know is to know him and you know, we were so lost without that how many people really knew about the lectures on faith at all i had no idea i'd never heard them discussed previously till denver and in fact when i when he mentioned it and i got the book and i read it i could barely read through it nor understand much of it because um, it's a different type of language and it's so uh, in depth but now because of everything that has been laid out throughout all these years um, I can now read it and go now I understand nice. so it's corrected my faith um, yeah, me too me too Still have a work before me, I know. <laughs> like, <laughs> I think we all do. I, don't, I remember when Denver said that there were, uh, it was talk eight, where he said, there are some here who have read the second comforter and taken seriously uh, you know, what the Lord had given that, or what were given in that and have come to know the Lord. And he was talking about people in that room. There were some there. He was thinking, okay, I, if it's possible to even read the second comforter, taking it as a manual guide. Well, 
should I not have come to that myself? Like, why is it <laughs> for me? I like it. It feels like it's going to take me a lot longer than maybe some people. <laughs> yeah, anyway. <laughs> it's a good thing all our journeys look different from one another then. Um, Thank goodness for that, right? I certainly see in your life and knowing you all these years, um, your life is set on a course as well. And um, I see the Lord working in your life. So I'm glad that I don't have to have check off boxes and mine can be my journey with the Lord can be exactly as it should be. And I don't have to worry about, well, it doesn't look like that other person's experience and why haven't I had that yet? But just for me to be constantly holding in my mind that that's what I desire and Lord, help my feet to walk that path. And then I just trust it will, whatever experiences I need, um, it'll happen in the right time. I've seen him working in you and Andrew and your family's life too over these years. What <clears throat> what your understanding has just grown so much and the things we've shared all along the way. I just I find it really beautiful that um <clears throat> That which has been opened up to you, and then you share it with us, and that, and, that, and there's so much truth in that. So I'm grateful for your journey. <laughs> so when we both go, oh, I don't know what I'm doing, and I can't see the Lord, I can't feel the Lord, and I feel, and we're like moping around and having a tantrum. We can remind each other, hey. <laughs> The Lord's working in your life, and I see it. So look up, keep going. There's a there's a little saying I got from somebody last week. It's something along the lines of um, when you think God is silent and not talking, or no, I'm gonna have to find it. Something to the fact that. When he he doesn't seem so close, just remember that <clears throat> the teacher is often silent when they're during a test. Hmm. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'll find the clue. It's probably a lot better than that, but <laughs> it was along those lines. Mm -hmm. When we feel like he's not close by or he's distant or he's not answering. I had, you know, I thought that was a good reminder that maybe he's just, he's not, it's not that he is gone. He's just, we're going through a test and he's overseeing the test. Overseeing the test. Yes. Thank you, Paul. That's a beautiful thought. <clears throat> God has to say to us, this is what I want you to do. If no one else will say it to you, I am saying it to you. Everything that has been said in this talk, which began in Boise and concludes here today, everything that has been said is in fact exactly what happened when God offered something to an earlier generation through Joseph. He, God, is offering something again right now in our day to you, to any that will hear, to any that will listen, the work is beginning again. I suppose it was necessary that what began in Joseph's time had to run down to the condition it is in at present. It had to become a leaky ruin of a farm that Joseph himself no longer even wanted before it was possible for the Lord to say, at this moment, return and you leave. Can't you see the signs of the times? Can't you look about and see the whole world is waxing old like a garment? Can't you see there is now a balance of things kept at bay, 
only to preserve the possibility of a remnant being claimed by God. God promised he would do this. If this can bear fruit, the Lord may give more time and keep the angels from beginning the harvest. That will depend on what we do. I really have not done anything more than read scriptures and bear testimony to you. They are true. This was not my idea, and I can't tell you how happy my wife and I will be when we conclude this project. There will be this transcript, and I'll edit all the transcripts from the 10 lectures and put them into a book. To be readable, the book needs to have run-on sentences and grammar fixed to a degree I am not undertaking in the transcripts. That is still left to do, and I will do it before a book is in print. But the real project and the labour needing to be done will be by you. It's kind of funny, in a way, when, and I feel sorry for him, but I'm grateful when he feels like relief that, okay, these 10 talks are done, dusted, finished. I don't know if he knew how further it would go along and the type of people he'd have to labour with that are probably really trying his patience. And... <laughs> yeah. Uh, how many years later he's had, how many other talks to give? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and even yeah, more was... bigger projects like the scripture project and uh, the covenant and, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's some... There's still stuff going on with that, too. Yeah. <clears throat> Surprising. Whew. <laughs> that poor guy. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, you can continue reading. <laughs> if you don't mind. Sure, I can do that. If you don't lay hold upon this, if you don't move this forward, if you don't rise up, I suppose he will find another people. But you ought to accept this invitation and then come to the feast he offers us. You should want to be numbered among those who choose to have the gospel live again. The gospel should not be the words of an old book. The gospel should be alive in you, rolling forth with new vigor. Every new day should be a new revelation to you of his involvement in your life and in the lives of those around you. I know it is not easy to let yourself stand out. For some of us, it is really unpleasant. I am a trial lawyer, but you have to understand that what that means is that I am usually engaged in an intellectual fight in a room with six or seven people in it. If we have a jury, we may have up to 18 in the room. What I do, I don't do in front of big crowds. This speaking to hundreds at a time has not been a pleasant thing for me. I enjoy the law. I particularly enjoy ap appellate arguments because there it is just a three-judge panel or a five-judge panel, depending on which court I am in. It is just a small intellectual undertaking in which you are trying to reason something through. This kind of venue has not been pleasant for me, but I suppose what you are being asked to do will be even more unpleasant for you. All of you have your families, your friends, your neighborhoods, and your wards. Many of you are faithful members of the church, and I commend you for that. And I wouldn't want to be the source of creating a problem there. But the Lord has in his mind a way of doing things in which, if we follow the pattern, we get power from Christ. We may get ordained by a line of authority that comes down through another man, laying on hands on our head the authority to activate that comes from heaven by the voice of God. If you follow that pattern, the fruits will follow. 
When I say unpleasant, it is probably an understatement. If there are a thousand different fellowships, each will have a unique challenge. You are asked to proceed without being correlated, free to work out your own way to follow the Lord. There will be some people who are complainers, who will bring complaints with them into your groups. They need your love and patience. You may be able to help them overcome a lifelong personality issue that can be cured only by your kindness to one another. Do not be discouraged by the problems. Prayerfully confront them. Do not ignore or hide them. Confess them openly and be patient with one another in finding the solution. Some people have suffered from lifelong abuse by religious authorities, including their parents. They have never had a healthy religious experience. The fact they remain willing to try is itself cause for hope and encouragement. Help them. Love them. Let them find peace among you, for that is what we are asked to do. Be willing to mourn with those that mourn. Comfort those that stand in need of comfort. Stand as a witness to one another of God at all times and of all places and bear one another's burdens that they may be light. Suspend judgment and give such assistance as you can to one another. Maybe what they will need most is your listening ear and open heart. Um, whether or not these talks make any difference at all does not depend on how well I have spoken them. They depend entirely upon what you now do. If there is any fruit to be produced, the fruit will not be me talking or the CDs or a book, ultimately. That is not the fruit. The fruit is to be found in your lives. The fruit is to be found in your influence, in your family, with your children, in the light that comes into your lives and the lives of those who know you. My mind is actually being cited to uh, the city of Enid and Melchizedek's people that it uh, wasn't those men, it was the people that heard the message and changed. They and took it seriously and responded. And it feels like, okay, so here's another opportunity that has been given um, to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, so we either become the people that didn't take it seriously, like in Joseph's day, I guess, uh, in previous circumstances, or we decide we are going to be different, <laughs> we're going to do this differently. Right, and I think we can't let, because, you know, it, it's obvious, like, all or a lot, I don't know every single fellowship, but a lot of the fellowships are struggling right now. It feels like it's come to an awful pimple head at the moment and it's kind of festering and I don't know, that's what I'm, I'm hearing and feeling. Um, but we can't let that burden us down or like we have to be looking about how all this light and truth is affecting us. What are we going to do? Um, how can we continue to look up and bear one another's burdens and um, mourn with those that mourn, um, help each other find peace, all of that. Because um, I guess that everything is happening in perfection of how it needs to happen. And the only way we can, well, our bodies are evidence, the only way we can get rid of some of the dirt, detritus, infection is for it to come to a head um, and burst so that healing can take place. So, um, yeah, I have to just bring it back to my own self and go, what fruit is in my life? What is, you know, 
I'm thinking of all the, the fellowships. I'm thinking of everything you just read here. Um, in fact, I was looking, thinking back to uh, this line you read. Every new day should be a new revelation to you of his involvement in your life and in the lives of those around you. Like every day, a new revelation. And I think back and I'm like, yes, that's true. But it requires labor. Like I experienced that for myself within my own walk and family. Um, in the simple things like doing the dishes and housework and I have the scriptures playing um, on audio and even just being busy like that, listening to the scriptures, a new insight will come, a new understanding. That's a new revelation that can happen daily in my life. Little things like that, but we have to put the labor in. Um, uh, right. Absolutely. It's work. It is work. I think it's interesting that the Lord, that we have all these different fellowships because I, was, I can't remember where it was that Denver says you can't. Corrupt them all. You can't corrupt them all. That's what I want to do. Right now, is, um, it's not like one church, and that one church is headed by men who are corrupted. It's many, many, many little fellowships that, oh, you know, some have gone a little wonky. <laughs> some have, well, there's been division that we've seen in our own fellowships breaking apart. And, I think we've all experienced that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and it's, I think it's good because then it's a growing experience. And if we let it be that, it's a growing experience. But uh, I mean, there's some that are holding fast to truth. I don't know all of them. I don't know how many are out there, but I I do believe there are some that really are walking in that truth. So. And you know, I hope that those fellowships that. Um, that are holding on to that light and truth and actually, you know, have a, a good solid community built on the faith that's been laid out, that God will take and use that. And for all the others, perhaps myself included, that have gone wonky, we can look at that and go, oh, that's what, it, uh, that's what it's supposed to look like. Okay, I'm going to learn from that and I'm going to take that experience and that example and while I have breath, I'm going to come on board with that. Um, yeah. I hope I can let down whatever pride I have or let go of rocks I may, I may be holding in my backpack and just uh, be open. Right. So the, those words, humility and meekness, broken heart, contrary spirit, those words seem to ring in my head more frequently. And the only way to keep the covenant is, is by being those things and not have pride. They cannot be pride. And I fear that maybe that's pretty easy to Pride is so easy to <laughs> what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> to let in, be have that. Uh, I'm having a hard time really voicing my words or voicing what I'm thinking today. But I was thinking. Uh, do you remember in the ten? The, or the little parables. What's that book called? Ten Parables? Actually, I don't remember what it's called. Is it Ten Parables? 
and the the great I forget the even title, but the one about the competition. The great um, competition, yeah. How at the end the Lord brought all of them back, including the ones that were thought bad. <laughs> um, and um, the competition wasn't what it, what everybody thought. So I keep that in the back of my heart too, that um, or in my heart that the Lord knows all things in wisdom and while I may judge and, you know, think, well, well, that's a bad one, that didn't work, well, God's going to bring it back and maybe the competition is a little, and maybe the test is a little bit different than what I presume <laughs> and can I be, will I be open in that day to go, oh, well, the ones that I thought were bad were actually the good ones and I was the one that was off and... <laughs> okay, I, I need to learn from that and, and receive that. That's definitely something to think about. <laughs> Makes me want to go back and read that parable and analyze it again. Mm -hmm. Consider. You're right. What God considers what we consider righteous is often not exactly what God considers righteous, so. Right, and he sees into people's hearts, which reminds me that the uh, Denver said there's only three things that can remain pure in this world, and that's God's love, the truth, and our hearts. So even if our actions are chaos, <laughs> But our heart intent was pure. God looks on that. So I'm thankful for that. Me too. We're going to need his mercy. <laughs> for all the greediness that we tend to do. <laughs> well, did you want to finish reading this page and I can start the next one? Sure. All of this is only an opportunity and no guarantee. We must rise up in faith to take advantage of the opportunity. In the beginning of Joseph Smith's dispensation, when the opportunity was given by heaven, some given the greatest of opportunities did very little. A church conference on October 25th, 26, 1831 allowed several additional men to receive the high priesthood. During the first day of the conference, Joseph taught them that the order of the high priesthood is that they have power given them to seal up the saints into eternal life. Sidney Rigdon, who spoke off afterward, added this caution about those who were to receive the privilege to be ordained to the high priesthood, telling them that they, if they then should doubt God, doubt God would withdraw his spirit from them. Following Rigdon, Joseph again addressed those who would be ordained and said, he had a testimony that each had one talent, and if after being ordained they would hide it, God would take it from them. On the second day, following an opening prayer by David Whitmer, Sidney Rigdon again spoke and warned them, the Lord was not well pleased with some of them because of their indifference to be ordained to that office. Exhortation to faith and obedience setting forth the power of that office. We can likewise show indifference so we can proceed in faith. We can fail or through our humility and genuine desire, we can connect with heaven. I was reading um, the account of Joseph Smith's mother, Lucy Mack Smith about uh, from her her journals and uh, I find it really curious how some people uh, Joseph Smith met one day who he didn't know before they uh, they came to visit him at his parents house to to meet this man with whom you know had the gold plates and 
He meets them one day. By the next evening, he's ordaining them. And they turn out to be, uh, later on, not firm in the faith. Uh, they turn against Joseph Smith. And mm -hmm. I think we can learn from that. <laughs> um, like he was quick to ordain people. He was quick to, to trust people. Um, had the same intent of heart as his own. And I think part of uh, these fellowships is to help us learn to walk with each other and to not be hasty, um, to hopefully develop relationships where we can know each other's heart and intent and, you know, our struggles, our weaknesses and... I don't know, there's something to that, that these fellowships provide that when I read the account back then, it was very hasty in a lot of the things that happened without Joseph Smith or others really knowing who these people were because they hadn't walked long enough together. But it came out after <laughs> um, they had walked a little bit that their intent wasn't the best intent at the time. And, and I think the fact that for a man to, uh, to be able to perform any ordinances outside of his family, I think it's a good thing that the, there are seven women who have to sign that certificate. But there again, it's also taking the time to walk with the, these people and to be able to understand who they are, <laughs> maybe they're intense or good or bad. So this is this has been a new experience all around. Yeah, and I think even initially we all moved in haste with um, the excitement and the innocence of it all. Of of course, let's ordain men among us. That's wonderful, without realizing that. Uh, our own husbands could perform those ordinances within the home while we were getting to know each other. And I remember feeling pressured to sign men's certificates that I didn't know. Um, and then um, it turned out that, that wasn't a good idea. So um, I really do feel it's important now that we've been established for some time as a movement to now rely on our walk together and the relationship to know who we are sustaining to perform ordinances uh, within the community. And um, for me, I need to, to know the man now, unless it's by direct revelation that I know it and <laughs> I can't deny it that I need to, you know, this man needs a certificate. But, right. Um, yeah. Uh, learning to use the wisdom in all of this and how important she is she is for us now in all of this yeah amen this process can be so informal that when we conclude today if there's still time everyone who wants to can call a conference and begin doing some things today it is that informal there are at least seven women here and some of you brought your wives. Let me end by testifying to you that however improbable or unlikely all of this may seem, to those of you who spend any time at all thinking about this, it was just as improbable when John was baptizing. It was just as improbable when Christ taught. It was just as improbable when Joseph Smith said, I had seen a vision, I knew it, and I knew God knew it, and I could not deny it, neither dared I do it. It may seem improbable, but it is true. Now, in order to confirm, conform to the burden laid down by God and Scripture, I need to turn time over to Keith Henderson. He has something which must necessarily be added as part of all this. So, Keith, it's all yours. Want to read that, Paula? Are you okay to read? My mouth is dry. Oh, that's good. 
a second witness, Keith Henderson speaking. 52 years ago, I came to this area on a mission for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I came to bear testimony of Jesus Christ and the Book of Mormon and the Prophet Joseph Smith. Today, I stand before this people again of this area to again bear testimony. My growth in these 52 years has been great, but my testimony still remains very simple. My name is Keith Henderson. At the time I bear this testimony, I am still an active member in good standing with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I am grateful for this opportunity that I have I received to lift up my voice and bear my witness and testimony before the Most High God, before His holy angels, and before all of you who would be witnesses with me that this talk given this day by our friend and God's servant is a message given from God to all men and women everywhere who will hear or read. I so witness that I know that it is. I have attended every portion of this talk, making 10 in total. I have listened time after time to the recordings, and I have read every transcript made up until this one. I bear solemn testimony that I have received the message by God's voice of their truthfulness and also of his desire for us to believe in and act upon these things that have been spoken. I stand as another witness with Denver in the law of witnesses that these things are true, and I expect to be held accountable for this in the days and the eternity to come before God and my Father and to all men. I bear this testimony humbly and solemnly but in the power of the Most High, Most Holy Priesthood, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. It was actually pretty powerful. Yes. Mm -hmm. In the lore of witnesses. And then, uh, I guess, Lou was the second witness, um, Lou's testimony in the cover of um, preserving the rest, yeah. preserving the restoration. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then the next part is uh, just the transcription of Denver's appeal letter. Um, and I, I guess know if you want to read that. should we read it? Why not? I'm fine to leave it off. I've read it so many times. <laughs> yeah, we don't have to do that. So, uh, tomorrow, I guess we'll jump back into the Book of Mormon. Okay. Unless anyone has specific that they would like to study. I mean, we could go through one of Denver's books or we could uh, read a certain book in the scriptures but we left off in uh, I think it was Alma I'll send it to the group so I don't know where it is now we're in the war, war chapters I think uh, of Alma uh, yes one of the later chapters I'm fine with going back into the Book of Mormon. There's so much more to learn from that. Yeah. And we started, it's interesting, because we read a whole bunch of different things. And then um, I think it was Michelle Taylor, when she was with us, suggested we read um, from King Benjamin. So we jumped midway into the Book of Mormon. So now we're reading to the end, and then after the end, we'll jump back to the beginning and read back to King Benjamin. <laughs> so it's a different way of doing it, but it, right. um, yeah, it's it's good. Oh, all right. Well, I guess I'll offer the prayer. <laughs> oh, good. 
Heavenly Father, we come unto you grateful at the end of our uh, study group this morning to have been able to complete the 10 talks. And we are thankful for the deep dive that we took and for the added insights and truths and deeper understandings that you gave to us individually and, and together. We are thankful for the labor of yourself and your servant in order to correct our faith and to build for us a firm foundation to stand upon as we reach up to you. We pray, Father, that as the song said this morning, that you would abide with us. And please continue to abide with us, even though um, this has been a great learning experience for every fellowship and every person, and that there's been a lot of contention and strife and turmoil, and there's also been a lot of growth and good. We pray, Father, that you will continue to labor with us or those with whom you desire to labor with. And, um, that you will continue to move the restoration forward and onward and back to the point where um, it began in the beginning. We just offer this prayer with gratitude in our hearts for daily revelation, daily insights, and daily growth that we are receiving. And offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Eva. Yes, thank you, Paul. Trying to see how to hold on a second.